Hey, today we're kicking off a brand new series called Grit. Oh yeah, Grit. I'd say if there's one thing we need to follow Jesus in 2022, it's grit. I mean, come on, at a global level, we've been through a, a, a pandemic and the polarization of politics and division and tension and war and gas prices. And then even on a, an individual and personal level, maybe it's divorce or a diagnosis or depression or the desperation of unemployment or the fatigue of chronic pain or the, the sting and the hurt of loss or the disappointment of unmet expectations or failed dreams. And bottom line is the need for grit is nothing new. The 21st century is tough, but guess what else was? The first century and the second and the third and every century since then, which by the way is why Jesus said, I mean, he called it. He said, in this world, you will have trouble, comma. He tells us to then take heart. And my message to you, our message, this series is that it takes grit to take heart. It takes grit to take heart. And nobody, I don't think, had more of it historically than the Apostle Paul. I mean, this guy, I get a kick out of this guy through shipwrecks and snake bites and setbacks and beatings and mockings and floggings and prison sentences from his conversion all the way to his brutal and untimely ending. Grit was the anthem of Paul's life. In fact, he says this in Philippians 3, verse 14. He says, forgetting what is behind, which is a lot of stuff he's talking about. I'm straining towards what is ahead. I press on. Notice those verbs, straining, and I, I press on. It takes grit toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I'm running this race called my life in a way that I'm, I'm trying to win the prize. It takes grit to do that. And for our series, our working definition of grit is this, a God-given ability to step out and press on in difficult situations. Angela Lee Duckworth, she is a psychologist, a PhD, a, a New York Times bestselling author. She is known as the guru of grit because for years her and her team studied and answered this question right here. What makes people successful and why? And they studied all kinds of different contexts from why some cadets make it through military training at West Point and some don't, all the way to why some kids advance farther than others in the National Spelling Bee, to why some teachers last longer and generate more impact in more challenging school districts, to why some salespeople make more money and are more successful at private companies. And across all of those contexts and more, there is one characteristic and one trait that stood out head and shoulders above the rest by far. And it was not talent. It was not good looks. It was not intelligence. It was not even the hand that life dealt. It was grit. Grit, the place where your dreams meet determination, the place where passion meets perseverance, the God-given ability to step out and then to stick it out. Not just for a week, not just for a month, but as a way of life, amen? So we're gonna call this message for week one of grit, bring on the waves, bring on the waves. So let's pray, Jesus, we love you so much. Thank you for a church to call home. We shut out distraction, quiet our hearts and our souls. Would you speak to us in a way that transforms us? In Jesus' name, amen. All right, church, anybody afraid of heights? All of our locations, be, be bold, okay, thank you. Okay, how about this? Anybody deathly afraid of heights? Like you would rather swim with great, whites, great white shark, Shannon, in the open ocean than climb a, a step ladder, you know? I, um, I, I, I ask that because what I'm about to tell you is a true story. This is a true story. The year is 2009, and I am in line to go bungee jumping in New Zealand. Now, really quick, don't be fooled. That just made me sound a lot cooler than I actually am. And by the way, this was back in college, so before that, the part of your brain that tells you not to do dumb and stupid and dangerous stuff develops, and I think in guys, it never like fully does. I don't know, I'll keep you posted on that. But this was back then, and I am in line 
to go bungee jumping and I witnessed the two most contracting, contrasting experiences that a human being could possibly have going bungee jumping. The two most different situations and experiences. So the first one was this 30 year old man, we'll call him, we'll call him Kevin. I never met Kev, but I do know he was afraid of heights, okay? Kevin was deathly afraid of heights to the point where he'd rather go to the dentist for like 10 hours than stand on his tippy toes for 10 seconds. That's Kevin, okay? So naturally, his friends, because they're good friends, they peer pressure him to conquer his fear by going bungee jumping. And I go, like, maybe we try an escalator first before we jump off a bridge. (laughs) You know, this is a little zero to 60, but Kev agrees to go, and now Kevin finds himself standing on a rickety, wobbly bridge. To all of you afraid of heights, I just apologize for the scene I'm about to graphically paint for you right now. But he finds himself standing on a wobbly, rickety bridge that spans across this rocky gorge with a giant rubber band Velcroed around his ankles, staring down at a raging river that is 300 feet below him, okay? And just so you know, when you're on the platform and you've crossed the red line, the bungee employees, for legal reasons, are not allowed to touch you or assist you, and that's gonna be a very key detail here in about 60 seconds. Because fast forward for Kevin, 15 minutes, and he is still standing there on this platform, looking like a ghost. I mean, hands are sweaty, knees weak, arms are heavy. Don't, I mean, don't laugh at that. That joke is so tired, it's been done, okay? It's like high school and college marching bands playing crazy train at football games. Like, I feel like I'm taking crazy pills. I'm like, guys, have we not been playing this for two and a half decades? Like I'm getting, getting sidetracked. I'm long-winded to begin with. Back to Kevin. He is standing here and he's looking down at the river. First mistake, he's looking down and he cannot get himself to jump. He can't do it until the crowd starts counting down. Now, I don't know what it is about guys in countdowns, but once there's a countdown, I swear it's like you no longer have a choice. There's something just wired into males that we have to submit to this non-existent authority of a random countdown from a group of strangers I've never met before. Guys, stop it, stop counting, because as soon as you hit zero, like I have to do this, and they, they go five, four, three, two, one, and Kevin, he has this like one moment of crazy, insane bravery, and he takes a small step, or one giant leap for him right off of the platform, but then immediately, his senses kick back in, And he turns around, total panic mode, turns around and on his way down, grabs onto the platform successfully. (laughs) And remember, the employees are not allowed to help him, which to me is just really the best and greatest detail (laughs) that gives me the most joy from this story. And of course, his buddies are just laughing hysterically at him. I'm like, oh, show me your friends. I'll show you your future, Kev. This is it, buddy. This is it. (laughs) How long do you think you could hold on, Logan? A couple minutes? Kev made it one minute until his fingers failed him, and he uh, he bungee jumps. (laughs) And I'm like, I guess you can go home and tell all your friends I went bungee jumping as long as you leave every detail of how it happened out of the story. Because you know he's hanging there too, thinking, I am going to die if I let go. (laughs) It's a croc-infested river. I don't know that for a fact, but you don't know there weren't crocodiles. It's New Zealand. There probably were. Makes the story better. 300 feet above a croc-infested raging river, you guys. I'm going to die. And then he bungee jumps and, and he falls. By the way, falls feet first, and that's where the rubber band is attached to. So that's a little whiplash at the bottom. Don't do that. It's just a pro tip for you. Right after Kev, right after Kev, this 12-year-old girl (laughs) named Kaylin, and that's her real name, and she really was 12 because I talked to her. She got strapped in, and she steps out onto the platform, and she's also nervous, and her hands are, are also shaking. 
She looks over at her mom, <laughs> who smiles at her, and she smiles back and takes a deep breath, and she just dives. The most graceful dive we saw all day. My first thought was, dang it. <laughs> now I have to go. <laughs> I can't not now, and I gotta be kind of cool doing this, and I think I was somewhere between a Kevin and a Kaylin. Um, it was nothing special. But Kevin and Kaylin, the two most different experiences you can have bungee jumping. And over the years, to me, this has become the perfect picture for the two ways I believe human beings step out and step into the unknown. Because we're all heading there. It's May of 2022. None of us have ever been here before. We're all rookies when it comes to May of 2022. Time marches on. The future is becoming the present. Some of us are stepping into new seasons or new positions. Some of us excited about it. Some of us dealing with the, the disappointment of unmet expectations. We are embracing new norms and we are trying to navigate very challenging times. And we are not called to hunker down and play it safe and hold on for dear life until our fingers fail us and we fall. We are, we are called to leap with a childlike wonder into the the unknown with a gritty, a gritty faith that believes God is who he says he is and will do what he promised. And my message to you is you got more grit in you than you might think. And I know that because God put it there. It's in you. It's kind of like a muscle though. It might be time to exercise it a little bit, but I'm telling you it's in there. I'll say it this way. There is a determined, there is a passionate and gritty, faith-filled giant that you already are in Christ Jesus. Now it's time to live it like you actually believe it. That's what this series is all about. I wanna show you this in Matthew chapter 14, 14, because in this chapter, Peter follows Jesus straight into the unknown and he goes for a walk on the waves in a storm with his savior at three in the morning. And I wanna use this story to show you a little bit of what grit is and where to find more of it. So let's go, Matthew chapter 14, we'll start in verse 22. Immediately after this, now that this refers to right after Jesus feeds 5,000 people. Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. And meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land for a strong wind had risen and they were fighting the heavy waves. At about three in the morning, Jesus came toward them Walking on water, of course, because that's easier than walking around the lake, I guess. When the disciples saw him walking on water, they were terrified, and in their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost! But Jesus spoke to them at once, don't be afraid, he said. Take courage, I am here. Then Peter called to him, of course he did. Lord, if it's really you, then tell me to come to you walking on water. <laughs> What I love even more than that question was Jesus's answer. Sure. I'm sorry, what? Yeah, come on. God, it's a little windy. Did you? No, come on, let's go. Like, be careful what you ask God for. He might just, he might just say yes. So Peter went over the side of the boat. Peter got out and walked on water toward Jesus. That's crazy. So here we go. Three things grit is and where to find more of it. All from Matthew chapter 14. Peter's gonna give us a little pep talk here. Number one, grit is the guts to get out of your comfort zone. Grit is the guts to get out of your comfort zone. Some of us are under the impression that following Jesus promises a stormless life. And I'm not sure if you believe that, I'm not sure who told you that, but it's, it's not true. Remember, Jesus is omniscient and sends his boys to cross the sea without him, fully knowing a storm is coming 
while he goes and feeds 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and, and, two, and two fish. So Jesus doesn't promise a stormless life. What his promise is, is for an anchor in every single storm. And by the way, isn't it interesting that when Jesus feeds 5,000 people comfort food, they love him. But then as soon as Jesus confronts them on their lives, they leave him. They love him and then they, and then they leave him. I think a lot of Christians associate Christ with comfort and we associate the devil with disruption. When in reality, it might just be the devil keeping you comfy and it might be Jesus who's trying to interrupt your regularly scheduled program. I'm just curious, when was the last time you had a moment where God disrupted your life? When was the last time the omniscient one disagreed with you on something? I'm like, I think that should be a, a fairly like frequent thing or else you might be making this God in your image and not the other way around. When was the last time you let, you let Jesus challenge you on that secret sin pattern that you become okay with? And trust me, I get it. I, I'm a creature of comfort, you guys. I will change out of these skinny jeans and into sweatpants within 20 minutes of getting off this stage. I promise you, a creature of comfort. I love, I love it, predictable like, that's why I'm about to start The Office for the 11th time instead of watch the new TV show that everybody is recommending to me. That's why I will go to the yard house for a day and order the seared ahi tuna salad instead of trying a new restaurant. I'm like, man, we've got enough. I'm telling my wife, like, babe, we got enough just craziness and chaos and unpredictable stuff in our lives. Like, let's just watch The Office tonight. I need something that's familiar and something that's the same. We are creatures of comfort, me more than anybody else, and comfort is cool. I'm just here to tell you that it's overrated because nobody grows in their comfort zone. Peter's comfort zone was being in a boat with his boys. That's what he was familiar with. But then Jesus shows up walking on water and Peter's God-given grit speaks to him and says, I know you wanna stay here, but if you pay attention to it, you want more to get out of this boat and walk to Jesus. Do it afraid. Why? Because fear is not the enemy of faith. Familiarity is the enemy of faith. I wanna read this quote by Harv Ecker. I could just read the first phrase and then we could just say amen and, and worship. Nobody ever died of discomfort. Discomfort never killed anybody. Yet, living in the name of comfort has killed more ideas and more opportunities and more actions and more growth than anything else combined. Comfort kills. And you're free to disagree with me. I think Christians in 2022 have, have two major obsessions, comfort and calling. And we want both at the same time, don't we? We think, well, if it's, if it's my calling, then it'll be easy. If I'm following Jesus and I have problems, then something's wrong, something is off. And I would say, no, I think your biggest problem is that you think you shouldn't have any. That's where you grow. What's true for companies and organizations is also true for you, that you are either risking and growing outside of your comfort zone, or you are, you are playing small and playing safe and dying, just holding on until your fingers finally fail you. Something deeper in you would rather get out of your comfort zone. So this picture right here was taken about four years ago when me and Sam were on our way to Austin to plant a church. And I know that's a, that's a happy picture, but inside, internally, I am dying, you guys. Not just from the humidity, I have never been that uncomfortable and that afraid in my entire life. The whole way, just driving and thinking, this is so stupid. <laughs> Like we had it made. Why are we doing this? This is not gonna work. I'm telling you guys, man, for the last four years, I have, I have never been this uncomfortable and I have never felt this alive. I have never been this uncomfortable. I have never grown more 
in my entire life. And, and the pattern for, for that journey has been the same pattern that I've, I've seen play out time and time again, not just in my life since salvation, but in, in my friends' lives as well, where the very first thing, I remember the very first thing God called me to step out of the boat and, and, and level up and take a risk was to, to sign up to join a group back in college, a small group. And then the very next year, he challenged me again to, to lead a small group. And then, and then I had the challenge to, okay, how about that internship? How about, how about that mission trip? How about you step out of your, your boat called control and security and, 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 take, and, and try giving and try generosity for the very first time? How about and like, or, or giving that message or moving to that city or having that difficult conversation or praying that dangerous prayer or starting that church? All of these things I have felt called to and none of these things I have felt ready for. So if you feel called and yet not ready, I wanna just encourage you, that might be the sweet spot, right where Jesus wants you to be. Because that means you don't stand a chance if he doesn't come through, that keeps you desperate, and that is a beautiful recipe for experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit in your, in your life. And so are you in some way, shape, or form out of your proverbial boat? Are you stretching yourself in any, like is there something you're doing that is stretching your faith? Because I would say your faith needs it to. It needs it to. Like for some of you, that's joining a group. For some of you, that's becoming a leader of a group for the very first time. For some of you, that's releasing the first 10% of your paycheck and sowing it and giving it and getting out of this, this, this pathetic boat called control that we think you know what I mean? It's just like, for some of you, that's having that conversation that you've, been, that you've been putting off. For some of you, that's getting out of that friend group that's letting you stay in that addiction. For some of you, that's getting out of that relationship that you know is causing you to settle for less than God's best for your life. For some of you, that's writing that book or going to counseling or moving there or staying here. For some of you, it's forgiving that person or confessing that sin. I'm telling you, God has put within you the grit to get out of your comfort zone. So bring on the waves, and I'm not telling you it's easy, I'm telling you you'll be glad you did. You have the grit to get out of your comfort zone. And I think I wanna give you this little purpose pep talk today because so oftentimes we come to church for comfort. And so often like, we, we need it. That's why the Holy Spirit is known as the comforter. He just does his best work when you are outside of your comfort zone. That's where Jesus was, not in the boat, out in the waves and in the wind and in the waters and in the storm. The Holy Spirit is the comforter. Jesus is the disruptor. And I felt God nudge me for this week. He said, what if I don't want anybody leaving comfortable? What if I want, what if he wants you to be so disrupted that you walk out of here and you, you do something this week? What if he wants you to be so uncomfortable that you actually, you actually change? And like James 1, I'm not just gonna merely listen to the word and deceive myself. I'm gonna go apply this. I'm gonna do what it, what it says because I can't, I can't stay here. I can't stay here. Why? Because Jesus is out there. I know you wanna stay in the boat, but like Peter, I'm telling you, I think there's something deep down if you'll listen for long enough that wants to get out of it more than stay in it. And grit is the guts to get out, amen? We gotta keep going. Number two, grit is the realism to face the facts and the idealism to never lose hope. So Pete's on the water and then Matthew 14, 30 says, but when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. And he shouted, save me, Lord. Now on surface level, we read that and we think lack of faith. Wow, Peter. He, I mean, he is sinking. He's in a low place. You know what I'm saying? Peter's really drowned on his luck. You know, pick your pun. I don't care. Where's the faith, Peter? But to me, you guys, I read it again and I go, that entire verse is faith because that entire verse is surrender. He saw the wind. He saw the waves. He realized I can't save myself he surrenders and he reaches for, for the one who can save him. To say yes to a savior means to confront and admit the reality of sin. 
And that word sin is a word that our world hates and honestly is trying to just pretend that it's not real. To me, I'm like, that's, it's just the most obvious thing in the world. Because I know me and I know the world that I live in. And if the answer was inside of us, you guys, to fix this, it would have worked already. Like it would have worked centuries ago. We need something bigger. We need something or someone beyond who can be for us what we can never be on our own. And so we need something, and and faith allows you to face the fact called sin and cry out to Jesus at the exact same time. So that's called realism and idealism. The realism to face the facts, the idealism to never lose hope. So Jim Stockdale was a prisoner of war back in Vietnam, and he was a prisoner of war for seven years, was tortured 20 different times, and yet he survived. And when Jim was asked about his experience and how he made it through, he said, I did two things. And this is now known as the Stockdale Paradox. He said, number one, I maintained an unwavering faith and idealism that I would prevail in the end. And then number two, this is the realism. I also confronted the brutal facts about my present reality. In other words, I had the grit to get real about my my situation. I wasn't an ostrich with my head buried in the sand pretending there's no lion, there's no lion. Like I got got real. I told myself the truth. And then they asked him, well, what about the ones who didn't make it? Why do you think that was? And then he said, without hesitation, he said, oh, easy. That was the optimists who didn't make it. The ones who thought, oh, this Christmas, this Easter, this fall, Okay, now this Christmas, this Easter, they were, they were so continually devastated that it eventually ended them. So faith is, is so much more than optimism, I think, is the, the number one takeaway from this, that faith is not afraid of the truth, you guys. God is not surprised by the situation that you're in right now. In fact, faith allows you to actually face the facts that are in front of you. I would say it this way, until you can face it, faith can't fix it. Oh, it's not an addiction, it's just a bad habit. It's not a toxic relationship, he's, he's got potential. It's not that bad, I can, I can buy this and buy that, I just will continue to not check my credit card balance for a few more months. I mean, this is the great unifier, church, that we are, we are all on some level just professional pretenders. That's why I'm like, let's just, we'll keep pretending our Starbucks lattes are coffee and not milkshakes. <laughs> I love coffee. No, you love milk and sugar. <laughs> the reason grit is the number one indicator of success is because it's realistic and idealistic at the exact same time time. It faces the facts without wavering from hope. When you can have confidence in what you hope for tomorrow and yet still tell yourself the truth today, you set yourself up for breakthrough. For believing in financial freedom tomorrow, I'm not going to waver from my hope in that and yes, uh, and yet I'm going to face the journey of grinding and giving and investing and saving that I have in front of me today. I am believing for the six pack tomorrow and facing the plank today. And it's not weakness, it's strength to look at it and go, man, okay, that that is an addiction. I am in pain. I do have church baggage. And I I think it has an expiration date. Like I've been holding on to this for way too long. I I I do need to have that conversation. I I am hiding. I am pretending. That is strength, not weakness. John 8, 32, you will know the truth and the truth will what? Set you free. God is not interested in blessing who you're pretending to be. He's interested in blessing who you really are. Remember the sequence in the office where Michael Scott quits Dunder Mifflin and then he goes to start his own paper company and Pam goes with him? If you don't remember this, you can go watch season five, episodes 20 through 25, not that I'm counting. (laughs) And on their very first day of starting this new business, they fail epically. They don't sell a thing. And Pam, in the backseat of her car, starts having a panic attack. She thinks, what did I just do? (laughs) We have no money. We We don't have an office. Michael, not even, like, what's wrong with me? Not even your grandma believes in you. Why did I, like, what is, and this is one of those rare endearing moments for Michael where he sort of confronts her with this fatherly truth, and he says, you listen, listen to me, kiddo. He calls her kiddo, and he says, you quit. You quit your job. I quit mine. We both quit, that's the facts. This is our situation. 
which means we have one option. And by the way, I do my best work when people don't believe in me. And he's not giving her good news, but there's something grounding about it because she breathes out and goes, somebody's telling me the truth about where I'm at right now, which means now I have a starting point. Do you have the grit to say, okay, this is where I'm at? Because Craig Rochelle would say, people would rather follow a leader who's always real than one who's always right. In order, uh, in, in other words, real and authentic over perfect, real over a facade. And I think, by the way, just to, he's not even, he, he didn't know I'm gonna say this, but our church is so gritty, you go to a gritty church. And the reason, I think, is because of our lead pastor, because he is so brutally honest and vulnerable and authentic about the stuff he's going through, the pain in his life, and, and uh, once again, strength, not weakness, and he, he can do that because he knows who his God is and that his God is who he's not and can do what he can't, and it's, it's, so, it's so refreshing. Grit gives you the ability to be completely real about the brutal facts of my present situation while being idealistic and not wavering from my hope that everything's gonna be okay and Jesus is still on his throne and I'm going to prevail in the end. I'm gonna get there tomorrow, but in order to get there tomorrow, I actually have to stop lying to myself about where I'm at today. So we can, we can start this thing and Jesus would love to go on that journey with you. I'm gonna... My next point, there's so much I wanna say, oh, but we gotta, we gotta finish this. Okay, point number three. Grit is the tenacity to get up again. Matthew 14, 32, 33, after Peter sinks and cries out for Jesus, Jesus pulls him up and then it says, when they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshiped him. You really are the son of God they exclaimed, and I love that. Peter got back in the boat and they worship him. They worship Jesus with Peter. And nobody's like, I see, I learned this concept from Judah Smith about how you can read the Bible and just, it's kind of fun to assume what you think it's gonna say if it's logical, and then actually read it and you go, wait, that's not what, because what you think it's gonna say is they all get back into the boat <laughs> and all the guys gather and huddle around Peter <laughs> and go, hey, bro, probably shouldn't have done that, though. <laughs> like, that was, I mean, you could call that, like, a, a major moment of success, but you could also say it's not how you start, it's how you finish, and Peter finished drowning, okay? This was a failure, and, and so you think they're gonna get back in the boat, and I'm like, does nobody even care that Peter, like, he almost just drowned, and he's in there probably just shivering and shaking. I'm like, Bartholomew, give him your jacket. Come on, man. Maybe you could get mentioned in the Bible if you just do, the, like, do one thing, man. <laughs> and nobody does. Nobody, nobody cares. And what's crazy is neither does Peter. They get back into the boat and all eyes go straight to Jesus. And they start worshiping the one who met them and anchored them in the middle of their storm. And I just think, man, that is so, that is so powerful because let's call, let's just say, okay, Peter failed. Peter was the closest one, geographically speaking, to Jesus of all the 12 guys. So there's 11 guys completely dry in a boat and there's one guy sinking in the ocean in a storm, but it's that guy who has more proximity to the presence of God, which means Peter is on to something. I'm telling you guys, we have this weird fear of failure so much that we read stories like that and we all go, failure, that's failure. Can you guys believe this? Like, we're so timid about it, but I wanna rewrite the narrative of failure because I think you will either fail your way to success or you will not try your way to failure. <laughs> Failure is just simply, it's just on your way. I mean, this is Kinsley, my, my one and a half year old daughter. She learned to walk about six months ago. And you know babies, they have the uh, tiny bodies and, and big heads. And so they stand up and let go of the coffee table and take a step. And then eventually gravity takes over and it's either step again or, or die, <laughs> you know? And what happens is like step, 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 and then fall. Step, step, step fall, step, fall. And nobody at the fall, in the house, in the living room, all the family gathered around, nobody goes, are you kidding me? This kid can't walk. <laughs> Weckonmans are walkers, babe. This is, your, this is your genetics, not mine. I want our money back. This is a joke. This is, nobody says that. 
step, 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 fall, and the room erupts and goes crazy. You wanna know what I think happens to you when you step, step, fall? When you step, step, falter in your faith? I don't think heaven goes, are you serious? You should be farther along than this by now. I think this is the face of the great cloud of witnesses right now. I think that's the Trinity looking at Peter. Nobody's thinking, God can't even walk on water. They're all going, oh man, a human other than God just did that. Are you serious? Nobody's looking at the, the sinking part. Everybody's looking at the fact that he just walked on H2O right now. This morning I was praying for this, this church and I felt like God said, there's somebody who has been in rehab and then out of rehab and trying so hard to find freedom and you stumbled and you fell and you relapsed again. And you think God's face towards you is, you kidding me? And I think, I think that's the great cloud of witnesses. I think that's the Holy Spirit and Jesus and, and God the Father going, three months, he made it three months. Okay, let's fall forward. Let's pick yourself up, let's keep going. Let's go longer. You are, you're closer to freedom than you were three months ago. That's not a loss, that's a victory. Are you kidding me? You're out of the boat, let's go. Whatever it is, you're, you, you feel like you're struggling right now, you feel like you're, you're letting him down. I'm telling you, you couldn't if you tried, Christian. Keep picking yourself up. Surround yourself with people who won't let you stay down and will push you forward into the more that God has for you. That's what Jesus did to Peter. They got back in the boat and everybody just worshiped Jesus, including Peter, who I think was on cloud nine that night. Going, yeah, what's, you guys, that's what's up. <laughs> I just did that. I'll go farther next time. I'm growing because I'm outside the boat. I'm outside my comfort zone. There's this grit within me. It's waking up, something's stirring right now. I've got this idealism and this unwavering faith and hope that God is who he says and Jesus is coming back and everything's gonna be all right in the end and he's gonna get me where he's trying to get me. And yet I can also face the facts right now. Okay, this is where I'm at. This is what I'm going through. This is the addiction. This is the dependency. This is what I've been ignoring. This is my credit card balance. This is, okay, I gotta face reality, stop lying to myself and tell myself the truth like Michael Scott to Pam and ground myself in something that's real because Jesus wants to bless what's real, not what you're pretending to be or the season that you're projecting on Instagram. He wants to meet you where you're really at and say, yeah, now that you, you're facing it, faith can fix it. So let's go. Failing, oh, you, hey, spoiler alert, you're going to. Thomas Edison, I didn't fail. I found 10,000 ways not to make a light bulb. And he is ultimate Mr. Success. Clearly changed our entire, changed the world. Failing 10,000 times. You need to change the narrative for what failure looks like. Grit is picking yourself up. Here's what I'll, I'll finish and just say this to you guys. What is it? I want to, God's got me. God's got me. So I've got this. God's got me. So I've got this. God's got me. So I've got this. Whatever it is that you're in, you feel like you're out on the water. You feel like there's a storm in your life. You feel like this is the unknown. I'm telling you, God's got you, which means whatever your this is, you've got this. You are more than a conqueror. And Romans goes on to list a lot of reasons for, here's all these things and none of these things make you not more than a conqueror. It's a pretty exhaustive list. You are more than a conqueror. God's got you, which means you've got this. He is going with you wherever you find yourself. And so, yes, we are moving forward and we are, we are being challenged and dared, I think, by the big man to leap into the unknown, not, not holding on for dear life, not playing it small. Even on our, on our drive to Texas, Sam was eight months pregnant in that picture. And I'm thinking, babe, we're not about to bring a beautiful baby into this world so we can start playing it safe and playing it small. We're bringing a little boy into this this world so that we can show him an example of what it looks like to be Kaylin and not Kevin and leap into this life because we only get one and it's short and I wanna maximize the God that I experience and the impact that he brings through my life, man. 
So let's go. You've got this because God's got you. This is Joshua 1.9. Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Why do you not have to be terrified or discouraged? Not because there won't be storms and waves and wind. There will be. But because the Lord your God will be with you. Jesus will be with you on the water outside of the boat. This is Matthew 28 in the Great Commission also. As you go into the world, to the ends of the earth, lo and behold, surely I am with you always even to the very end of the age. I've got you, which means you have got this, amen? Guys, will you stand? Man, I just, it's an interesting time to be alive. It's an interesting time to be a follower of Jesus, building the church. Um, probably not the most interesting there's ever been, but in recent history, it certainly feels like, man, okay, and just what an honor. What an honor it is. I found myself a few nights ago God, going, God, I wish we were starting a church in the 90s. That sounds so much better than, and um, I know every decade has its stuff, but I really was like, God, and what I felt him say was, man, you are, it's not, it's, not a, it's not a coincidence that you're alive in this decade, that you were born into this country, that you live in the city that you live in, that you're good at what you're good at, that you're bad at what you're bad at, that you have the passions you have and the burdens you have. It's not a coincidence. You were truly made for such a time as this. And what an honor to get to be followers of Jesus when the bungee jump is really, really high and the river is really, really infested with a lot of crocodiles, guys. What, like, what an honor that the stakes seem so high because, man, you were, you were, you were cut from this cloth, you are built for this. There is grit that God has given you that is inside of you. There is a spiritual giant, a faith-filled giant that you already are in Christ Jesus. And now it's time to live like you actually believe it's true. And so whether that's for you this week, you're gonna get out of your comfort zone in some way, shape or form. Maybe that's praying about signing up for a group or starting to serve or starting to give or moving or staying or having that conversation you've been avoiding or trying forgiveness that has been poisoning your, your, your blood, your divine blood for a decade now. Like if there's, you need to get out of the boat. Your faith needs you to. Our church needs you to. This country needs you to. It's closer to Jesus, man. And you will find yourself sinking probably. You will find yourself failing probably, but your proximity is what matters. The proximity with the Savior is the point of all of it. Maybe you need to get real about, okay, I've been lying to myself and saying that's just a bad habit. No, it's an addiction and I need to face it because faith won't fix what I won't face. God's not surprised. God has given you the faith that has the grit to be honest and real about, okay, this is my, this is my situation. I don't have to be more than this because Jesus already is more than this. I don't have to be, he is what I'm not. He's got me, he's not shocked. Even if I confess to him, he goes, yeah, I already know. That confession, by the way, was for you and not for me. And now that the truth has set you free, let's do something about it and let's head towards this idealism and don't let your hope or your faith waver because I got you and we will sink and we will founder and we will, we will fall, but we're gonna fall forward because I'm coming back and I'm still on my throne. And Jesus, you guys, this is, this is so real. What an honor it is to get to be followers of Jesus in the United States of America, in Brussels, Belgium, wherever it is that you're watching this from in 2022, there is grit within you. And so like those disciples on the boat, all they did was just start worshiping Jesus, singing to him, hey, bring on the waves. I wanna be where you are, Jesus, regardless of how far it takes me. The safest place to be, the best place to be, is right in the middle of your will, even if that's in the middle of the ocean during a storm, walking on water. I wanna be where you are, regardless of how far it takes me, so bring it on. So Jesus, we love you so much, and we just, I thank you that you are the God who calls us out of our comfort zones. I thank you that you're the God who lets us try our strength so that we can strengthen our grit and mature and, and, and be more complete and be stronger and grow. And I thank you that you're also the God who, when we need it, you reach down and you pull us up and you're not gonna let us stay here. You're not gonna let, you're not gonna let us fall, 
like completely sink, you're gonna lift us up and pull us forward into the more that you have for us. And so Jesus, I thank you. I pray that you would reawaken something on the inside of us. I just feel like it's a dare. I feel like we need to say yes to a challenge, to something that scares us. We need to practice some grittiness right now. So wake something up on the inside of us as we proclaim, bring on the waves. Help us to remember these aren't just, it's not just a phrase. That is one of the most dangerous prayers that you can pray. So as we sing it, let us not do it lightly. I pray we'd have the boldness to sing it, but I pray it wouldn't be a lie, us proclaiming it, that we would say and sing, bring on the waves, and we would believe it because we know that's exactly where you're going to meet us. In Jesus' name, amen.